and a difficult man, difficult art, but important, I thought I would end this course on a joyous note with this man, uh, Henri Matisse. When asked what motivated him, he said, I'm after an art of equilibrium and purity. I would like people who are weary, stressed and broken to find peace and tranquility as they look at my pictures. Of course, there was much more to him than that. Yet, who would fail to be joyous at this painting of his, Joie de Vivre, which caused a sensation in the 1905 salon in which it was exhibited, eight feet wide, no one had ever seen anything like it. Or, who fails to be moved by his dancers? So powerful and yet so simple. But here there's a subtle sophistication at work. At first sight it looks like a simple picture of a maid just putting some fruit on a bowl uh, on a table. But as we look, we see that there's something a little bit odd about the picture. There doesn't seem to be any transition between the wall at the back, the table, and the floor on which the chair is resting. And as a consequence of this abolition of perspective with which he played for much of his career, we're drawn into the picture and the red engulfs us. Color for Batiste was everything. And towards the end of his life, the essence of woman, created by the very simplest of means. All of us, as we get older, try to simplify our lives, and Matisse did it like no other. He was born uh, in 1869, uh, just the year before the Franco-Prussian War bro broke out, in the cold, wet northeast corner of France, uh, near the town of Bohème. And there, his father was a prosperous uh, general store owner who'd come from a long line of Flemish weavers by the name of Mathis. As a he specialised not only in general goods, but particularly in the selling of seed and fertiliser to the sugar beet farmers who planted in the grounds around the, around the town. During the Franco-Prussian War, when Matisse was just about 10 months old, the city was overrun by the Prussian troops as they rapidly advanced to engulf Paris. The area was undergoing at the time mechanisation, not only for the sugar beet industry, here the uh, sugar refinery there with steam blowing out, but the textile industry, which had hitherto been largely a cottage industry, almost everybody at home was making textiles, this was now becoming mechanised as well. And the demand was coming from the newly opened department stores in Paris, which were demanding high-quality textiles with sophisticated design. And this is something that this particular region specialised in. And these highly designed textiles would feature in Matisse's work for almost his entire life. They left a profound impression on him from his childhood. At the age of 12, he went to the neighbouring town of St Quentin to start at the Lycée. He struggled a little bit with his academic work, but the, this particular Lycée was renowned for its art department, for they were grooming youngsters as potential designers for the textile industry. And at the age of 17, his father took him out of school at the appropriate time with a view to getting him to study and take over the good, the general store uh, which was prospering, but he really showed no interest in that. And as an alternative, his father arranged for the family lawyer to take him on as a copy clerk. There he did quite well, uh, doing what was required of him, and the lawyer in charge uh, thought he had some talent and sent him off to the Sorbonne to do a course in law. I don't think it was a full degree, but he came back and was appointed chief copy clerk uh, to the law practice in this small town. There he developed an interest in art, which he'd uh, had from his drawing classes at the Lycée. And there um, he went to the uh, St. Quentin School of Art and Design as a part-time student, while still as a full-time co uh, copy clerk in the lawyer's practice. And there he drank thirstily art copying as many things as he could and making, with all his money, buying copies of the works of the great master in the form of prints. But he was 
a sickly young man, becoming even more so now with recurrent episodes of abdominal cramp, so much so that he was actually admitted to the local hospital for investigation. In retrospect, this was almost certainly the diagnosis of what today we would call spastic colon, which is psychologically induced because of the stress of being a copy clerk when really he wanted to be an artist. And just to seal the point, whilst he was in hospital being investigated for his cramps, his mother brought him a box of oil paints to pass the time, and of course the bug was there, and the rest is history. Studying as he did at the Sequentin uh, School of Art in part-time, he looked, as many young aspiring artists do, starting off with still life. Why still life? Because it's easy to assemble a few things at home and to paint them without the expense of a model or the paraphernalia of landscape. And here he goes to our friend Corro again, and he studies Corro's work, and he does his first oil painting here, which you can see at the age of 21. His teachers at the St. Quentin School of Art are so impressed with him, they say, well, you really do need to pursue this, and recommended that he went enrolled at the St. Julian Academy in Paris uh, to further his studies, with a view, of course, to entering the École de Beaux-Arts, which was the way to fame and success, hopefully, if you were lucky enough to get in. And he submitted some work for this. Here is the Auguste Institution itself, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And you can see it's an intimidating place. He submitted work which was sadly rejected. He submitted work a second year. Again, it was rejected. His teachers at the Academy Julien couldn't understand why, because clearly he was talented, clearly he was devoted. And they recommended, instead of hammering away at formal entrance, that because of personal connections with the teachers at, Saint Ju at the Julian Academy, with this man, Gustav Moreau, who was already establishing his reputation as uh, a painter, um, and he was really regarded by the Ecole as something of a maverick. And it wasn't until he was 66 years old that he was actually admitted to the faculty of the Ecole. But meanwhile, he had a private academy, as it were, taking students. At the Ecole, he had just two sessions a week. Why was he a maverick? Because he was required to teach his students according to the Ecole's curriculum, of course, class to class, as everybody has to go through in their first year. But he encouraged his students, unlike the formal teachers at the Ecole, to use their imagination, to respond with your emotion, and be free in your use of color. And this, for the young Matisse, was music uh, to his ears. He was a, a good-natured young man and full of humor, and he was excellent at mimicking his teachers at the Julian School and was very popular. And his buddies there introduced him to a young 19-year-old shop girl, a model by the name of Camille, who very quickly became his uh, mistress, and before long she was pregnant. And here is uh, Camille painted from the back, already uh, in her pregnancy, uh, painted by Matisse. And this painting uh, was uh, highly regarded and was actually purchased by the French state. If only all countries were enlightened as France in promoting young artists. But there he was with his first sale, and this gave him a boost to, to his morale. He then takes some time off, and he goes with Camille and their young son now, uh, 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 Paul, Paul um, and uh, he goes off to a, an island off the coast of Brittany, the Atlantic coast of Brittany, and the rugged coast there, the um, Ile uh, called Belle Ile. And there he does the first of his paintings, and we'll see in many of his works the theme of an open window or an open door. And here is the first of these in the hut, presumably, that he'd rented for the duration of their stay there. And you're looking out over the sand, and there beyond is the Atlantic Ocean. Belle Isle had been uh, popularized by this man, John Peter Martin, who was a larger-than-life, rather wild Australian artist who had trained at the Slade School in London, as well as Cormons Academy in Paris, where Van Gogh uh, and um, Toulouse-Lautrec were also students. And he was very taken by the uh, Monet's Impressionism and painted in this sort of style. 
And young Matisse, wanting to find himself, was very taken, perhaps overawed a bit by the over-exuberant personality of this Australian. They became very good friends, he and his wife, and uh, uh, Matisse, and uh, his uh, uh, fiancée, if you like, uh, and son, they became good friends together, and Matisse started painting in this very colourful way, entirely on his own, painting a, a fishing boat, a sardine boat, coming into the small harbour in, uh, in the island. Back in Paris, he had accumulated from his days in the St. Quentin Academy there a lot of uh, prints, and this is by Jan Heem, 17th century Dutch uh, still life painter, and you can see it's a table absolutely groaning with fruits and silverware. And he uses this as a model for his first large painting, which is this, a dining table. It's called the dinner table. And here he gets Camille to dress up as the maid, and he borrows crockery and cutlery, some decanters, fills them up with cheap wine, and he paints this, experimenting with colour um, and composition. Now he meets his future wife, and this is Amélie Pereira. She was 21 years old, and she was uh, from uh, Toulouse in the southwest of France, from a well-to-do family there, and she was the maid of honour at a wedding to which Matisse had been invited. And she was drawn to him because of his elegant manner, his courtesy, his softness, and shyness, and she suspected insecurity. Every time they dated, Matisse bought her a bunch of violets, which she lovingly pressed into a book. And at the end of three months, they were married. They ultimately went on to have two children, in fact, within two years, uh, Paul and John. Um, and he took her for honeymoon to London, where they went to the Tate Museum to see the Turners. He then took her to Corsica, where he was dazzled by the light, so much so that he couldn't really paint there. But he did experiment, just he had lots of canvases and did about 50 rapid oil sketches. Here he's experimenting, just putting colours together to see how they are. It's the little room where they stayed in Corsica. And you can see Camille in bed there, uh, uh, sorry, um, Emily in bed there. And she's just putting the colours together in a sort of random way with no real thought for anything else. So now he's beginning to organise his colours. You see, in rather broad areas, the chair we can recognise, he's not concerned about her so much as just creating her out of these areas of paint. He was a great respecter of Cezanne, as all his followers were. And in my hurry to let you go to lunch yesterday because I was watching the time and I'd kept you from your lunch for which I apologise. There was one last slide which I didn't put up and it said Ah, Cézanne he is the father of us all and the author of that was Matisse. And here is Matisse, respectful of Cézanne trying to build up the structure of the human body as you can see with blocks of paint in much the same way that Cézanne had done with his landscapes. He admired Cézanne so much that he went to the exhibition that, on, that uh, Ambrose Vollard and his little gallery in Paris had mounted for Cézanne at the age of 56, his first one-man show, you remember. And there, what caught Matisse's eye was his three bathers. We saw the series of bathers yesterday, but it was this one particularly that he admired so much and wanted to purchase. Vollard knew there was no way he could afford to buy a Cezanne, because he was promoting Cezanne, prices were high, but he said, Matisse, what I will do is I'll let you have this in exchange for 12 of your pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but so he didn't feel abused, he says, but I will also pay you a thousand francs. And he accepted that. And this painting was actually owned by Matisse before it ended up in the Musée d'Orsay or the MoMA or wherever it happens to be at the moment, I'm not sure. Earning money was a problem, of course, for artists. He was on a small stipend from his father, who uh, was hoping that he would do well. And then the French government, in its enlightenment for the 1900 Grand Ex uh, International Exhibition in Paris, for which the Grand Palais had been built, employed artists 
in order to paint a mural, a garland frieze around the whole perimeter of the interior of the exhibition hall. And Matisse was one of the artists who accepted that offer, received a stipend, and for several weeks or a month or so contributed to this garland, which we can still see today. <coughs> Meanwhile, Amélie and the two children now were in a chateau down uh, to the southeast east of uh, Paris, and then when he'd finished his garland work at the Grand Palais, he went to join them in the chateau and walking through the garden came across these two copper beech trees. And again, it's an oil sketch. It's not intended for sale. or for, uh, It's a, just an oil sketch, so he's feeling his way with colour, remembering what Moreau had told him, use your imagination, respond with your emotion and be free with your colour. And this is what he does. This is stylized two copper beech trees. But this is Matisse where color is beginning to sink into his uh, neural network, I would say. But financially, things were not as good as they should be. His father, who had been generous in sponsoring his art, had now stopped his stipend because he had learned that Amélie was actually working and earning money. So he thought that that would teach his son to be financially responsible, that they should be independent. But Amélie's family were in trouble. They were highly respected Toulouse family, but they were involved in a lawsuit over allegedly misappropriating a family legacy. The case went on for two years with publicity in the newspapers, and the Amélie's family faced not only social but financial ruin if the case went against them. Ultimately, they were found not guilty, but it was a very difficult time. And as a consequence of that, Matisse, Emily, and the two boys were obliged to go back to Bohem, tail between their legs in a way, in order to live there in a rented property that his father had let them use. And this is the attic of that particular room uh, house in Bohem, where they lived for a while, um, trying to put their lives together. In order to snap out of this doldrum that they were in, Matisse wrote... Uh, to um, Paul Signac, whom he had known. Signac was some years older than Matisse. Paul Signac had been living for the last 12 years in Saint-Tropez on the Mediterranean. And he wrote to Signac, whom he had, I think he had met him once perhaps, but he wasn't a friend in any way, asking his advice, where can I stay? I'd like to come down and bring my family to get away from Paris for a bit to Saint-Tropez. And he organized them to rent this property here, and immediately everything cheered up. He was in the south of France, and here's Matisse drawing, the, uh, painting a watercolor of the place uh, where they stayed. You can just see the sea there on the left in the background. Signac was uh, a larger-than-life figure, rather like the Australian Russell, but even more so, he was an... Uh, um, what's the word? Uh, somebody, uh, somebody who doesn't respect authority. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, painted in this style. He had earlier gone into a sort of uh, recluse state with uh, Georges Seurat, and the two of them developed this style that is known as pointillism between them, exploring the use of colour. And Signac was larger than life, and uh, when he met uh, Cezanne, as when he met Matisse, who came down to Saint-Tropez, he showed him his work. Here's one work of Signac's bright, bright colours, and here's another one of the harbour, the little boats there bobbing around, as you can see. And then here he shows him another work that he'd done while still working with Seurat, who had died suddenly at the age of 31. And Seurat's style, as I'm sure you know, employs this pointillistic, very fine dots of colour which are supposed to meet in the eye where the whole thing is reconstituted. That was the optical theory of the time that underlay this movement. But what, he had, what uh, he had done here was influenced Signac to paint in that rather subdued colouring, unlike the garish pictures that we just saw that he did once uh, he was on his own. And Matisse saw this picture, and it's quite charming. I think you would agree in Telltale. You would think this was by Seurat rather than Signac, but they were working together at the time. And there you can see a family sitting out under the shade of a tree, father reaching up for a nut there, a couple of cockerels, a couple of men bare-topped playing petanque, 
an artist down by the water, can you see on the left-hand side there, a ship going by. And there on a path going down towards the beach is a couple looking for all the world as if they're taking a selfie. <laughs> so Matisse, under the influence of this overbearing syniac, uh, feels that this is what he should be doing. And here he does something lyrical in that same sort of style, bathers, relaxed, everything else. But somehow it doesn't quite work. He knew it. He took it back to Paris. He worked on it for a year and recognized that this is not, not him and it was not a successful painting. Things changed the following year when he went down to the little village on the Mediterranean right by the Spanish border called Collioure. And the weather was nice. And he rented a little place, and he threw open the French windows and looked out on the sea, and suddenly everything came together. A blaze of color, the emotional response of the scene in color. I'm not suggesting for a moment that one wall was green and one was cerise, but this is how he responded emotionally to what he was seeing. Little yachts bobbing around on the water there, little terracotta pots with flowers, and somebody seeing this picture described it as colour bursting like fireworks. And isn't that exactly what it is? He painted that, and he was on his own down there. Uh, Emily and the boys were with their family in Toulouse. And he uh, invites uh, a friend to come down and enjoy him here, join him there. And that uh, friend uh, was uh, André Durin, forgive me. André Durin was six years younger, uh, in fact, 11 years younger than Matisse, but they had met in Paris a little earlier. And he arrived down, he accepted the invitation to come down, a bit like Gauguin accepted Van Gogh's invitation. He came down, uh, spent two months with him, and they painted very amicably, and everybody left with their ears intact. <laughs> he arrived like a dandy, dressed in white, with a red hat on the back of his head, perched just like this, with drooping moustache, as you can see, and darting black eyes. And they were on good terms, and as little gifts for each other when they parted, they did each other's portraits. And here's H.M., he was a little bit modest. He didn't sign it Henri Matisse because he knew he was no portraitist, but he dashed this off and he gave it to him as a gesture of affection to André Durin, who in turn painted this very perceptive picture, portrait of Matisse, a thoughtful, introspective man, quiet, methodical, and that was his personality. Again, employing this exuberant color uh, that uh, was all the rage uh, at that moment. Uh, a blue shadow, uh, green hair, red beard, um, but nonetheless, in spite of that, what skill to convey the sensitivity and depth of this man. Emily, meanwhile, was the law case was over and she could now feel more comfortable. She went into partnership in Paris with another lady, and between them they opened a millinery shop. Elaborate hats, situated not many steps away from the Place de l'Opera in Paris in the 9th arrondissement. Fashionable area, for sure. Hats were fashionable. And interestingly, the shop that she co-owned with her partner was two doors away from a shop owned by the, uh, the family of Albert Alfred Dreyfus, who had recently come back from Devil's Island. There she tries on one of the hats, and Henri uh, Matisse paints her. And here he paints her in one of her elaborate creations with all this colorful style, as you can see. It looks like a great veg vegetarian confection on her head, a regal gown, and she's turning round to us, a green face there matching the wall. That didn't matter. It was just how he responded to the scene. And she's turning round as if to say to us, what are you staring at? He also does this little tiny sketch of her. It's only 16 inches tall. Um, it's become a celebrated work in the history of art, but that's by the, by the way. It's called the, lay, the portrait with the green stripe. But in fact, this was simply just a little exercise. It wasn't meant as a definitive painting at all. It was an exercise in segregating her face from light to shade, 
on one side and then juxtaposing the pink of her cheek on the right hand side of the screen there with the green and the yellow of her cheek on the other side with the cerise and the orange. It was simply just an exercise but somehow it's, it's assumed this monumental iconographic uh, status uh, which I don't quite understand. He went to the Luxembourg Gardens and again responding entirely emotionally he uh, produces this picture here and um, how he responded to autumn in the Luxembourg Gardens. This was exhibited, as we'll see in just a moment or two, um, in a salon of Des Indépendants with other works of these uh, brilliant uh, coloured paintings. And who should come there but Vasily uh, Kandinsky from Munich, who visited the exhibition. And if you look at Kandinsky's work, before visiting that exhibition and after, it is absolutely as clear as the dawn tomorrow that he was profoundly influenced by this little work of the Luxembourg Gardens because when you look at Kandinsky's paintings of the German alpine resort town of Murnau, it's almost impossible to say it wasn't painted by Matisse or to look at this and say this wasn't painted by Kandinsky. So a profound influence on this enormously important painter the pioneer of abstraction. For the exhibition, uh, here we have uh, Derain's work here. You can see uh, wild colouring. The trees look as it's a bend in the road. We can just see a carriage, a horse and carriage in the distance, trees looking as though they're on fire. And Derain had been working quietly with his colourful theory that he was developing with Maurice uh, de Flamanc. And the two of them had developed this style. And here's Flamanc's picture that he also submitted for the same exhibition. And at first sight, you would say, oh, well, that looks like Van Gogh, doesn't it? The, the brush strokes and the, the intensity of it all. And that raises a question. Why did Van Gogh paint the way he did, looking a bit like this? Think back to his paintings, particularly the acid yellows that he used and the electric blues. And these were the turmoil, the, the colours of the turmoil going through his head. And when you think of another painter from around the time who employed colour in an exotic, unusual, exuberant way, uh, you think of Paul Gauguin with his purple and orange and mauve and yellow uh, Polynesian ladies. Why did he paint them like that? Not because of turmoil in his head, although he was an interesting character from that point of view in his own right. He painted those ladies in Polynesia like that because of his profound disappointment with the reality he discovered when he actually went to Tahiti. And so this was a fantasy culture that he created in paint. So those are two reasons for painting in exotic colours. Why were these people doing it? It was simply an emotional response to what they were looking at, as simple as that. In the same room where all these works were exhibited together was this piece of this work here uh, by Henri Rousseau. And you can see there at the bottom a lion attacking a deer, another leopard in the trees there about to leap out. And this was in the room of the same people. And I think the uh, uh, person who had planned the, the exhibition really grouped all these together because really didn't know how to handle all these paintings which were so bizarre. <laughs> In the very center of the room was a pedestal, and on the pedestal was a little sculpture of a young boy, very much in the style of the Renaissance um, sculptor Donatello. And when this room was part of the review of the exhibition, this man here, uh, Vaucel, um, Louis Vaucel, looked around the room. He saw Rousseau's animal lion attacking the deer, he looked at the wild pictures around him. He saw poor little Donatello in the middle, and he said, oh, my lord, Donatello, consumed by wild beasts, which in French is les fauves, and that's how that colourful movement got its name, for what it's worth. Who else came to that exhibition? Not only Kandinsky, but this young man, a Catalan, who'd recently arrived in Paris from Barcelona, could hardly speak any French, darting eyes, mercurial in temperament, Pablo Picasso. And of all the artists he looked around in the room, the one he was most worried about as a potential rival, because this man was fiercely ambitious, was Henri Matisse. The two of them never met for a year. It was a year later when uh, Gertrude Stein, who was working, living in Paris with her brother Leo, wealthy American art collectors, actually introduced them. 
And all that, for the rest of their lives, they danced around each other. They were respectful, but they were very wary of each other. Because Picasso was so mercurial, in fullness of time, he came to dominate avant-garde art in Paris in the first quarter of the 20th century. But a bit like the story of the hare and the tortoise, it was Henri Matisse, slow and methodical, who came to dominate the second half of the 20th century, the second quarter of the 20th century. And so here were rivals. Matisse had had a daughter by Camille, you remember his mistress girlfriend, the model, young model, and uh, her name was uh, uh, Marguerite, and Marguerite was adopted by Emily, his wife, as her own daughter. She remained very close to both her foster mother, her stepmother, and her father for all her life. At the age of six, she nearly died. She had a, a diphtheria, and one of the, the reason you die with diphtheria is the thickness of the, infla the mucus and the inflammation in the airway leading to the asphyxiation. And she underwent, as far as we can understand, an emergency tracheotomy, usually carried out on a sturdy kitchen table, a knife just plunged in to allow her to bypass the secretions accumulating in her throat from the infection. And all the pictures that Matisse did of his daughter Marguerite from then on always show her wearing a scarf or something round there, hide the, diff the ugly scarring that she had there around her neck. Her, his daughter adored her father, and he knew that he was getting a bad rap from the reviewers. He was not a man very histrionic. He would clearly betray his disappointment that his reviews were not good. And she kept saying to him, Papa, Papa, we went to an they went to an exhibition together, and there they saw this painting by Puvis de Chavannes, who was now the early 20th century standard bearer for French classicism. He was the president of a new academy of art in France, highly respected, bearing the flag for the old guard. And it's a sort of semi-bucolic scene, as you can see. And the two of them went together, um, his daughter and Matisse, and she turns around and she says, Papa, Papa, uh, why is he so famous? His pictures are so dull. <laughs> and of course she was right. Yet her father borrowed this format bathers sitting around in an idyllic countryside scene transferred, transferred it here to a countryside in a rough sketch which became the beginning of this painting we saw a little earlier Joie de Vivre and it's worth just spending a moment looking at that because this was a sensation at the exhibition it was of course panned as being totally outrageous and we, what can we see on the bottom right there young lovers embracing Right at the very bottom, a girl there with the double pipe of ancient Greece, the Orlos. And way over on the left there in yellow against the red background is a girl there who's threading flowers into her hair, can you see? And there, towards the sea, this is actually a scene of a beach where they used to go as a family together, which is adapted. And there you can see the sea in the distance. And between the two girls lying, spreading themselves out in the sunshine in the midground there, we can see some dancers going round and round and round, which of course is what led to the dancers we'll see in a moment. Gertrude Stein was uh, a great collector. She didn't know whether she liked this painting, but she knew it was an important painting. And so that seems to be the criterion if you're very rich for buying paintings. And of course, she bought it not at all sure whether she liked it. But this was 1906. And in 1906, there was the great earthquake in San Francisco followed by a devastating fire. And this was of profound importance to the Steins, Gertrude and Leo, because they were major stockholders in the San Francisco Cable Car Company. And they were fearful that they had been financially wiped out by the earthquake and the fire. Leo goes off dashes off to San Francisco, and in 1906, it took you three weeks to get there, of course, transatlantic passage, then transcontinental, get across America. And he got there, and he found that three weeks later, there were still smoking ruins in San Francisco, but mercifully, from their perspective, the, set, the cable car system was still largely intact. And so he came back, and when he came back, he found Matisse's Joie de Vivre, which his sister had bought contrary to his wishes, I suspect, in pride of place in their apartment. And there it remained for two years until 
the Steins changed loyalty to this young Catalan, Picasso, when he had finally completed his secretive work on Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, the Steins bought that and that replaced the Joie de Vivre in their centre place in their apartment in Paris. He now goes off um, to North Africa again and is taken very much by Eastern imagery. Um, he couldn't paint because the light was so bright, but he was absolutely fascinated by the design, the motifs in prayer rugs and in carpets that he saw there. And he bought some of these, and he brought them back with him to Paris, and then he started playing with them, juxtaposing. And this is a sort of intellectual exercise he undergoes for the next few years. Um, when we see a painting by a great painter, it's, we hold it up and we say, oh, this is a Matisse. It's terribly important to see it in perspective, I think, as to where he was in his artistic development at the time. And this is an experiment. It is our Matisse, yes, but it's an experiment. And what he's experimenting with is juxtaposing Western shapes that are recognisable with abstract design from the East. So he's, it's a push and pull between these two realities. And here's an example. He also refers back to the textiles produced in Bohain for the for the Grand Magasin in Paris and uses that cloth but the same idea an abstract design or semi-abstract design with recognisable things there and then he produces this and I don't know if he actually intended this to be sold or anybody to put it above their uh, mantelpiece but it's a great confusion but a deliberate confusion because he's playing with shapes and planes can you see there is a, it looks like a dog had been out in the mud and walked across the floor there. But it's up at the, the wall at the back there and the floor in the front there all seem to be on one plane. So he's abolished perspective. It's all to do with pattern and design. Recognisable things and unrecognisable things. The juxtaposition. It's an intellectual exercise, if you like. There are a couple of recognisable things. A fireplace on the left, a table in the middle there with a cloth and some aubergine, a couple of figs and then a, a vase. But basically, to my mind, it's an exercise. On his North African trips, he made three in all. He went to Algeria and to the town of Biskra. And if you buy dates uh, in Europe, almost all dates in Europe seem to come from Algeria. And they come from thousands of date palms in groves densely planted on the fringes of the Sahara Desert near the town of Biskra. He also noticed in Algeria he was beginning to see for the first time African sculptures. And so now he's playing with shapes and now it's the human body that's coming in because he's been alerted now to the human figure which hadn't hitherto been of much interest to him. And here it's the shape, it's not a beauty, it's not erotic. What it is, it's shapes, round breasts, a round bucket, rounded calves, and the shape of the palm trees behind. It's, it's playing again another exercise is the way I view that picture. And here again, now he's, this painting here of three nude women looking at a turtle on a beach. The sand happens to be green, that doesn't really matter, the sea is blue and so is the sky. But what this is, the curved pink bodies of these three people here, young women here, are juxtaposed against rigid horizontals. So to me, it's an exercise in putting together shapes and patterns. And here again, he now softens the horizontals and gives the cloud a little contour, matching very much the curve of the back of the lady there uh, with the ball and the one crouching in the front. So I think this is where he is and why I think it's so important to appreciate the context of pictures when we look at them, which seems to re so rarely happen when we read about art or listen about art. Well, the Steins, having switched loyalty now to Picasso, there was a big problem. And that problem was, of course, a, a patron. And the gap left by the Steins was replaced by this man, Sergei Shukin, an enormously wealthy Russian industrialist with a huge mansion in Moscow who visited Paris in order to buy avant-garde art. And he knew about Matisse, and every time he was in Paris, he went to Matisse's studio and he bought up everything almost sight unseen. He says, what have you got? It's mine. How much do you want? And he paid him for it. And this is how he built up his collection. Perceptive, for sure. And then he gives Matisse a commission. And he says, um, I have in my, in my house, I have a, a wall where I want a large painting in blue 
Why in blue? Because I have 16 Gauguins where the color is predominantly yellow. <laughs> and so he asked, us and to, he asked Matisse to produce this uh, study in blue. And Matisse works away at it, and it didn't, didn't quite go in blue, so he does it in red. It's the one we saw a little earlier. But look how clever it is as a picture. There is indeed blue there. The blue are the motifs from the textiles in Bohain. I think we recognize them from the cloth that we saw a little earlier in white with the blue motif. But now, because he's abolished perspective, we don't know where the wall stops and starts, where the table stops and starts, or the floor. It's all one sweep of warm, embracing color. We're drawn into the picture by the waving fronds of this blue, these blue motifs. And so you can see where he's coming from. But what a beautiful composition it is. The white of the blossoming tree there with the white of the apron on the opposite side, the wickerwork chair in yellow, and the yellow fruits on the bars there. So you can see it's a hugely successful painting, I'm sure you would agree, unlike the many trials that we've been looking at hitherto uh, for that reason. And now Shukin wants his dancers. And he asks Matisse to do uh, some dances for him. And here is the dance, Matisse, for Shukin. And you can see they're stomping and, and prancing. And they look slightly uneasy, don't they? We don't feel completely comfortable with them. And yet there they are, undeniable, rather primitive, going up a hill, coming down a hill, going round in a circle, almost all joining hands. Shukin is absolutely thrilled. This is now 12 feet across, and it fits exactly the space on one side of his staircase that he wanted. And then he asks him for a companion for the other side, being thrilled with that one. That's just to remind us of the nature of dance and how primitive those figures are so reminiscent of the ancient Greek uh, dances on the vases. And now he asks him for a companion piece on the other side of the staircase. And this piece is going to be called Music. And this, to my mind, is every bit as effective, perhaps even more so, than the dance. Look at the figures. They look very, very primitive, don't they? We're not quite sure of the sex. One seems to be a male, but we're not sure, but all the rest are of indeterminate sex. They look very primitive. They're all arranged. Can you see on a hillside here, there's one playing a stringed instrument on the left, another with an orlos, and the other three have their mouths open. Presumably they are singing. But look at the way he's arranged them. On a hillside, one, two, three, four, in ascending order, and then go down again. Musical notes on a stave. And to my mind, he's not painting the musicians but it's, you could really re-entitle this painting The Origin of Music. And now for his own pleasure, he again plays with this perspective issue that he has. And here, at one moment, as we look at this, let me just draw your attention to the fact that it is in fact a room. If you go down the left-hand side of the screen, two-thirds of the way down, you can see a diagonal line which goes halfway up and then runs across. So that's the demarcation between the wall and the floor. Knowing that, we would then say what we're looking at here are pictures leaning against the wall or, face on, hung on the wall. Outline of a chair for what it's worth in a table. But then blink, stand back, and then look quickly again. You don't see that line anymore. And what do you see? Articles, pictures floating in space. So here's Matisse now exploring the illusion of art by abolishing perspective and the tricks that that can play. Once you detach yourself from, because our brain is so good, isn't it, of filling in the blanks. You see something and immediately you fill in the rest of it without even knowing it's there. So if you don't do that, by abolishing the line that tells you it's a room, it almost becomes an abstract painting, doesn't it? And now he goes back. He's just obsessed with these oriental things, east meets west, oriental carpet on the floor. Heaven help anybody who has this decor for their living room. But there we are. And it's a picture of, he's called it, the family. And there is uh, Marguerite, now a tall, lanky teenager, in black holding a letter. Her two, his two boys playing checkers there. And there is Amélie sitting on a sofa. And to my mind, they look as though it's, it looks more like, rather than an oil painting, like a collage, as if they'd been cut out and stuck on the pattern background. And I suspect that was exactly in Matisse's mind, the same way that with his early carpets that he bought back from North Africa and put on recognizable vases and 
this, that, and the other, the juxtaposition of the abstract with the real. I think he was playing with that now. Instead of the real being vases, they're actually people against the abstract. He's playing with this idea. A highly intellectual man, and I don't think that's always recognized when people talk about Matisse. And here he does something similar, but much more confined, much tauter. It's a, it's a self-portrait. Here he is, Matisse on the left there, his verticality stressed by the stripes on his pyjamas, and there's Amélie sitting in her chair in her black housecoat. And, he call, and then in the background, there are the shapes, and there's the abstraction. In the background there, we've got these red things in blue. Not really green flowers in a flower bed, not really water lilies, because they wouldn't be that colour, I don't think. Well, perhaps they are. But there we are. It's an abstract pattern superimposed with recognisable things. He calls this painting the conversation. But looking at it, I would rather call it the interrogation. <laughs> mm. And now he's introducing a third element, and that is fantasy. There's a reality in this particular picture. You can see the edge of a chair here, can you, on the left? The realistic leaves at the back there, realistic uh, bowl, uh, jar with water and some flowers at the back abstract pattern and in the front we see the realistic goldfish but looked at from above through refraction they now become an illusion of themselves so he's playing intellectually with all these things um, at least that's how it strikes me but now first world war and uh, suddenly he learns that the German army has swept through Bohain caused a lot of destruction the family house has been destroyed, his brother has been detained, and there's no news of his mother. And suddenly all the colour drains from his palette. In his studio on the fifth floor in Paris, he does get a view of Notre Dame and the two towers on the west face of Notre Dame Cathedral there, doing this in sort of geometric rigidity. Um, the joy has gone from his palette, even though there's a bit of colour left at the moment. He then goes down with his family uh, to the south, thinking that would be safer. And there he is in Collioure, the same place where he had that firework of colour, you remember, and now everything is black. So much so that he stops painting and takes violin lessons. He does take a break as things settle down, and he goes to Morocco, but still the war is raging, and it's the Battle of Verdun, which goes on for months and months and months, with hundreds of thousands dead on both sides, advancing 100 yards into the trench, retreating 200 yards, advancing 50 yards. And this seemed interminable, and this was playing on Matisse's mind while he was painting these paintings. So this is Morocco, should be full of joy, should be full of colour. We've got the watermelons in the market there, we've got a plant on a balcony, but instead of a plant it looks like a cactus. And there's a man in Arab costume with a uh, turban, a, coat, a cape, sitting there squatting, his hand raised like a lobster claw. And instead of bright, bright light, everything is black. In his notebook, he wrote that he wanted to do his own version of Cezanne's Three Bathers. And he gets round to doing it. Here there are four bathers, but they're couched in black. They have no faces. They're featureless, and this was the mood he was in during the First World War. The war comes to an end. He's down in Nice with his family, and everybody sighs a sigh of relief, although the cost was horrendous. And he learns that Renoir, who is living not far from Nice, is sick. And out of courtesy and respect to Renoir, an older statesman in art for him, he goes to visit him and finds a wasted, bent little Renoir in his bed, totally crippled by arthritis to the point that he can no longer hold a brush. Shortly after, Renoir dies. Matisse goes back to his room in Nice and paints this. Again, that open window theme that we've seen so much of. But instead of colourful boats bobbing around on the Mediterranean, the sea is empty. And instead of joyful bathers on the sand, people in black. There's a table, the blotter is black, even the mirror is black, and his violin case on the left there is empty. For the next two decades, it's almost as if he's lost. 
He doesn't really know where to go. So what he does, he puts together the things he knows best, his patterns, his shapes superimposed, a couple of uh, Moroccan screens at the back there, and there's a languid lady in white against a fireplace, another languid lady in the sofa there. To me, this is a picture of ennui, boredom. And here he paints another lady wearing Turkish trousers this time, a little bit of exoticism, and you'd think you'll be elevated by that, but look at her face. She is so bored, we become bored looking at her, and instead our gaze goes to, the, goes to the screen behind and all the patterns there. His physician recommends that he takes a complete break. Clearly things are not working out for him, and Matisse has always wanted to go to Tahiti to get this Tahiti out of his system he'd heard so much about, and so he takes a long trip across the Atlantic, across America, takes the ship, goes to Tahiti, and of course is disappointed. On his way back, he gets a message that Alfred Barnes would like him to do a mural for his private museum. Barnes was by training a pharmacist, and he had made a fortune by inventing a patent antiseptic. And this, a bit like Dettol, when I was a boy, we all put Dettol in our baths, at least my mother did for me, and I still see that Dettol insignia is alive and well in Cape Town in 2019. <laughs> but this was the Dettol of the day, I suppose you would say. He'd made his fortune and he spent it all on art. And he invites uh, Matisse to visit him in Philadelphia and shows him his private collection, and he asks Matisse to design a mural for the entrance hall of his uh, museum. And it's a large scale, it's a large 46 feet wide, awkward niches, a bit like in the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo had the same problem with filling the niches above the windows in the Sistine Chapel with pictures that were still harmonious yet respected the underlying architecture. And Matisse has got a similar problem. He takes all the measurements, he does the design, and he goes back to Paris, and then he does a, a moquette, a, a mock-up of this full scale cut out of paper. He gets the grey the paper for the background, the, the arches, blue and pink and black paper for the background, and then spends months and months cutting out figures to, put, to superimpose on those backgrounds, arranging the shapes until finally he ends up with a pleasing arrangement like this. Having finished that for 18 months' work, he goes back to Philadelphia to check that everything's in order to reassure Barnes all is well with the project, remeasures to be sure everything would fit nicely, and he'd got the measurements completely wrong and he has to go back to Paris and start all over again. <laughs> it's another 18 months. He gets, he gets the maquette done very quickly. Uh, maquette, I should say. Uh, gets it all done very quickly, and then paints what he's produced in a sort of collage of paper on canvas with paint. And it's that in three panels that is shipped to Philadelphia and put up. Matisse is thrilled with the result. He really felt good about it, certainly given the mood he was in before he started the project. Barnes is thrilled with the project. The right art critics are invited in, and of course it's panned by the art critics. So much so that Barnes, wealthy, enormously wealthy, will have none of it. He closes his museum to the public, and it remains closed for 30 years until after his death when the trustees allowed it to be open to the public again for the first time. Matisse, back in Paris now, is exploring different things. Here he's drawing, and now we're getting, he's old now, he's in his 60s, and, or getting older, I should say, in his 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say that 60 years ago. <laughs> um, and he does this, and we're beginning to see now, as we get older, we like to simplify our lives, don't we? we? How much clutter we accumulate in our lives is just unthinkable until you have to move home and you discover. And so it is with Matisse. He wants to simplify, simplify, and now he's in his 60s. And using that as a model, he paints this. A lovely languid, a languid woman in her bath, one would suspect. That yellow thing, I've been told, is probably a sponge, and that makes sense to me. And she looks at us with all innocence. What are you staring at? I'm just a naked body. What's, what's wrong with all of that? And she's so voluptuous and so big and so comfortable in her own skin, her feet and arms are actually projected beyond the canvas. She's just spread herself out. And what a successful work that is, taken on those terms, compared to what Matisse's rival Picasso was doing at the same time, his famous nude in a red armchair. 
which, to my mind, comparing the two, this is contrived and Matisse is natural. But that's a personal view, and I stand corrected if you take the opposite viewpoint. Second World War looms, and Matisse knew the Second World War was looming. He took the trouble of getting a Brazilian visa for himself and his family. But the occupation of France was so rapid that he had no time to effect it, and he was relieved to discover that France was divided into a northern occupied zone and a southern unoccupied zone where he was living in Nice with his family. And there, at the end of... Sorry, let me just say something important here. While he was living in unoccupied southern France during the Second World War, he was very ill. So much so that he underwent major surgery, which kept him in hospital for three months, complicated by 